Good evening. Uh, my name is Dr. Kyle Zellner. I'm an associate professor of history and one of the co-directors of the Dale Center for the Study of War Society here at Southern Miss. And I want to thank everyone for coming out for this event for the fifth biennial uh, General Buford Buff Blunt Professorship in Military History Lecture. We have very long lecture names in the Dale Center. I don't know why. Um, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences uh, at USM, who's going to kind of run our program tonight, um, Dr. Chris Winstead, who will speak about the Blunt Professorship and then introduce our speaker, Dr. Winstead. All right, well, thank you, Dr. Zellner. It is my distinct honor and privilege to be here tonight to uh, have to, to start us off with this introduction, introducing our speaker. Uh, but, but before we introduce our speaker, I would like to introduce you to someone uh, without whom this event would not be taking place. That is General Buford Buff Blunt. Uh, the clicker, sorry. Huh? Oh, clicker? Yeah. yeah, click one. Click one. There you go. Look at that. How about that? <laughs> I didn't even know that was coming. You're so well prepared. Sorry. And uh, so I'd like you to, to tell you just a little bit about General Blunt uh, and, and so that you have an opportunity after this is over to, to thank him for the evening uh, and to understand a little bit about his background and his funding of this event. And so uh, General Buford Buff Blunt, uh, this professorship in military history was established in 2013 with a generous donation by General Blunt uh, and others who wanted to honor General Blunt uh, to fund uh, research support for a USM historian over a two-year period as they work on a major publication in the field of military history. We're going to hear about such a publication in just a few minutes, I believe. And so uh, you'll, you'll see the results of, of some of that work here tonight. Uh, General Buford Buff Blunt graduated from the University of Southern Mississippi and was commissioned an Army officer from Southern Miss's ROTC program in 1971. I see lots of Air Force ROTC uh, shirts in here tonight, so thank you all for being here. Any Army ROTC folks here tonight? Uh-oh, they're in trouble. They're in trouble. I am very pleased to, uh, to say that our, our, our Army and Air Force ROTC units are both uh, housed in the College of Arts and Sciences. It's one of my great privileges to get to continue to work with those ROTC units. Great to see those Air Force shirts out there tonight. Um, uh, after graduating uh, from the Southern Miss Army ROTC program, uh, General Blunt went on to have a distinguished career in the U.S. Army before retiring in 2005. During his service, he held many important commands. Uh, General Blunt is perhaps best known for his command of the 3rd Infantry Division uh, during the Iraq War, where he led the division's attack into Iraq and its capture of the capital, Baghdad. Uh, and I hope last April some of you had an opportunity to be at the Dale Center's John H. Dale Sr. Distinguished Lecture in International Security and Global Policy, uh, where General Blunt, uh, alongside uh, uh, esteemed journalist uh, Ted Koppel, uh, talked about their experiences in Iraq as Mr. Koppel was embedded with General Blunt's uh, uh, Third Infantry Division as they went into Baghdad. That was a fascinating evening, uh, uh, just one of the best things I've, I've, I've seen here. And so I appreciate General Blunt's contribution that, in that way as well. And so also the history of the division's uh, exploits uh, also uh, was recently published in the book 21 Days to Baghdad, General Buford Blunt and the 3rd Infantry Division in the Iraq War by the Dale Center's own co-director, Dr. Heather Sturr. Uh, Dr. Sturr couldn't be with us tonight. She was uh, sent along her regrets that, that she couldn't be here. Uh, and so I want to take this opportunity to thank General Blunt for his generosity in funding this professorship. Uh, and, and just to say just a, a word about the, the private funding, the donors that help support research and scholarship here at the university and how important that is to us. Um, the work that General Blunt has provided through this professorship uh, and through other endowed, uh, the other endowed professorships we have, we don't have very many, uh, helps to really fund 
the highest level of scholarship that we have in the institution. It helps us to recruit and retain faculty. I can't you know, really express the value of these endowed professorships. Perhaps the best way I can say that is to say that one of the top priorities, the top priority for us in fundraising for the College of Arts and Sciences is to raise money for more endowed professorships like this one. And so we, we sincerely appreciate uh, your support, General Blunt. Let's thank General Blunt. He's right here. Thank you. Stand up for this. Thank you. And so with that, let's turn to our speaker for this evening. I've learned. Let's go, let's go one more. Uh, this evening, I am pleased to introduce our 21 to 20, 2021 to 2023 General Buford Buff Blunt Professor, Dr. Douglas Bristol. Uh, in 2021, Dr. Douglas Bristol Jr., an Associate Professor of History at the Gulf Park Campus and a Dale Center Fellow, was named the fifth Blunt Professor. Uh, Dr. Bristol received his PhD in African American History from the University of Maryland, College Park in 2002. He has taught at USM since 2003, and his research interests include African American experience in the military, uh, the all-volunteer force, and World War II. Uh, from 2021 to 2023, Dr. Bristol used the funds from the Blunt Professorship to conduct historical research at the National Archives in Washington, D.C., and other archives. There's some of that financial support being, being put to good use. Um, and he also utilized the professorship's funds to support the publication of his forthcoming book, War as Labor, Black GIs in the Army Service Forces in World War II. His talk tonight will focus on the book's central theme. So, uh, Dr. Bristol, stage is yours. Thank you, Dr. Winstead, for those kind remarks. Am I speaking loud enough for everyone to hear me? Okay, great. I'd also like to say thanks to uh, General Blunt for giving me this opportunity uh, to address a group of people that have been overlooked. There's a shelf full of books about black GIs in World War II. Unfortunately, they're all in combat units, which represented less than 20% of black men in the U.S. Army. My book aims to address the over 80% who were in the U.S. service forces. I thought I could begin to frame the issues that are involved with this research uh, by telling a story. Oh, by the way, the, the title is exactly what I'm going to say. Um, I don't know if it's eloquent, but hopefully it'll be very clear. I want to talk about Odra Bradley. He's the gentleman on your left. Um, he was interviewed following World War II. He served uh, in the Army. And in that oral history interview, he said as he came of age, so as he became a teenage man, he realized that in the small town of Macon, Missouri, where he lived, that, quote, if you were black, you could not have the opportunities that other people did, unquote. The only jobs he realized opened him in his hometown were menial bellboy, chauffeur, yard man. Um, during the war, Bradley saw the Army as an opportunity to improve his circumstances. He tried to volunteer for the Army Air Force, but they told him they weren't letting uh, black, black men take the test in St. Louis where he had driven, so he joined the Army. The Army assigned him to the Quartermaster Corps, and he drove staff cars in a transport company at Camp Carson, Colorado, for most of the war. So instead of chauffeuring white civilians around a small town in Missouri, Bradley chauffeured white officers around a small military base in Colorado. Um, if it seems like there really wasn't much difference between his work in civilian life and his work in the military, you've come across something really important. Uh, and that was uh, the tradition of the Army keeping black men in so-called black jobs that approximated the kind of roles that they played in the civilian economy. Um, that's not the end of the story, though. This is Sergeant Bradley. Uh, he was very eager. Uh, he, he really enjoyed being in the service and was promoted to sergeant. He was the head of his transportation company. And then 
1943, in December of 1943, everything changed. The Army Service Forces changed its policies for the use of black troops, which I'll talk about in this lecture. And as a result, Bradley was sent to a new Army base that had been created to train black quartermasters in Fort Warren, uh, Wyoming, and he trained as a salvage collector. So these are units uh, when tanks or trucks have been damaged, uh, they go retrieve them so the enemy can't use them. And so we could use them again. Spare parts were hard to get in the field. And so he did this in Europe where he supported combat troops. So he gets deployed overseas. And as you can see here, uh, after the war, he's guarding German prisoners of war. Now here's the point. Although he didn't pilot a plane, drive a tank, or march with the infantry, his status in the army had changed because his military assignment was not a traditional black job that paralleled the black job in civilian life. And so the question that this lecture seeks to answer is why did Odra Bradley's role in World War II change? And to give you a really oversimplified answer, there were two large complex forces. The first of these was mechanization. For this point, suffice it to say that when you have an army that has many, many, many more internal combustion engines, you're also going to need many, many, many skilled men to repair and service those engines. And almost immediately, they did not have enough. There was a manpower shortage. The army planners had failed to anticipate how much work it takes to support a mechanized army. Now, mobilization is the process of organizing your population and your labor base or your, your industrial base so you can use it, use it to its maximum potential to fight total war. Uh, and that's, of course, how black men came to enter the army. It really wasn't easy to get them in the army. At the beginning of the war, the Marines refused to accept black men. The Navy would only accept black men as stewards who were servants to officers aboard ship. And so that left the Army, which, take, which at that point includes the Army Air Force, to, to accept the bulk of all black men who served in World War II. To be specific, 9, 9, 922,965 black men served as enlisted soldiers uh, during World War II. Now, once those men are in the Army, there are many people in America who thought they should be giving are given a better uh, opportunity. Even before the United States entered World War II, black leaders um, had been lobbying for expanded roles for black men. So this is how the Tuskegee Airmen come about. This is how the 761st Tank Battalion comes about. The NAACP made championing the cause of GIs its one of its central concerns in World War II, and we can see the response that it got from the black public because the number of members in that organization surged over the course of the war. Ordinary black Americans had other ways to try to ensure that their brothers, sons, fathers, uncles would be treated fairly and equitably in the army by using their votes uh, or threatening to withhold their votes from President Roosevelt in the 1940 and the 1944 presidential election if he did not improve their treatment. All along, as you can see in this picture, uh, black GIs had white allies too. This is First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt, who was joined by clergymen, uh, northern congressmen, union leaders, who all advocated on behalf of black GIs. This is what we get as a result new roles for black GIs in the Army Service Forces, jobs that had formerly only been done by white GIs. So here uh, are drivers on the Lido Road, which I'm going to talk about later on in the lecture. This is a, a road that goes literally over the Himalaya Mountains to supply China and keep them in, in the war. So here's my main point. Manpower shortages and political pressure ended the Army's distinction between white jobs and black jobs in the Army Service Forces. 
This might not seem like a major change, but I'll explain at the end of the lecture, this is actually the opening wedge to the integration of the Army following World War II. Here's how I'm going to walk you through this. I'm going to give you a little bit of background, so we'll look at the history of the use of black troops in the U.S. Army, and then I'm going to follow that up by going into more depth with the impact of the forces of mechanization and mobilization before finally giving you a few examples of the new roles that black GIs were able to have in the Army Service Forces. <clears throat> so let's start out uh, with some background. Before World War II, black men had served in every war that the United States ever fought. As you can see here in the American Revolution, between 220 to 250,000 soldiers and militia members fought for the Patriot cause. They represented 4% of American troops. This tradition continued in the Civil War when we have 179,000 black men serving in the Union Army. They represented 10% of the Army, and some historians of the Civil War say since their uh, enlistment was delayed till about halfway through the role, but that 10% might have made the margin of the difference in terms of, uh, in terms of a war that really exhausted manpower through slaughter on the battlefield. Uh, there were also black men who served in the Navy, but one thing important to note in terms of understanding our subject tonight is large numbers of these black GIs were assigned to service roles. So they were quartermasters, moving supplies, cooking food, burying the dead. We see the same pattern in World War I, a little bit different. Uh, in this war, there's conscription, um, and that leads to 380,000 uh, black men serving in the army in France. That represented 13% of the troops. More than half of these men were assigned to service units, uh, more specifically labor battalions and stevedore battalions. So these are men who unloaded ships. Uh, the opinion of white officers in terms of the fighting abilities of black men was so low that the 369th Infantry, the famous Helm Harfiles, this is the uh, Black National Guard unit from Harlem, New York, um, was assigned to the French. They didn't want it. They didn't, general person didn't see the point of a black uh, unit, uh, but they went on to receive the Croix de Guerre as a unit and distinguish themselves. All of these things perpetuated a tradition of segregation in the U.S. Army, um, and these presented real obstacles for black men to make meaningful contributions to the war. The fact that black men could only serve in all black units meant two things. One, there was limited types of black units. So they weren't, there wasn't a black unit for every kind of military occupational specialty. Again, they were mostly labor battalions. So that limited the opportunities for the most talented black men uh, to take on more technical or, or staff roles. <clears throat> in turn, when you cluster black GIs in a handful of service functions, it limits how useful they are to military commanders in the Army because they can only be used for certain things. A very specialized tool. Facilities were also segregated uh, in, the, in the Army and the expense and time to construct separate facilities for black GIs actually presented quite an obstacle at the beginning of the war to increasing the number of black soldiers, even when the War Department has set its mind to, to achieving certain goals. Moreover, segregation didn't mean separate but equal. Segregation meant separate but inferior. And so those were the barracks and the dining halls of black men, oftentimes uh, Black soldiers were just put in tents without floors in places of that flooded. Uh, even when the facilities were more standard, they always were put at remote areas of the base, which made it hard for them to enjoy the amenities, such as the PX or the theater or other, other such things, the USO. Um, if you're getting a sense that segregation means that black people are, are being kept in their place within a military context, you're right because we see that in their consistent assignment to manual labor. Uh, as I mentioned, most black GIs at the beginning of the war 
were assigned to general labor battalions to perform unskilled manual labor. And so the, the racial classification of soldiers, rather than their skills or their qualifications, largely determined the work that black GIs did in uniform. They were excluded from high status assignments in combat units, staff positions, and technical jobs, which were reserved only for white GIs. Instead, the Army gave black GIs assignments that kept them in their place in the Army's racial hierarchy. Black GIs didn't like it. They said that being handed a mop or a shuttle, shovel, and by the way, what, what are these gentlemen holding right here? Those rifles? Right, you got a picket there, there's a shovel, and that's hence the term picket and shovel brigades for the labor battalions that these men served into. Um, black men said it was an insult when they received these because uh, these assignments violated uh, the promise of equal tri treatment that had been written into law with the 1940 Selective Service Act. I'll talk about that more in a little bit. It also violated the promises that FDR had made on the campaign trail in 1940 and 1944. It's not that the Army was arbitrary. The Army's very thorough. The Army likes to study things and have reports. Unfortunately, those reports um, incorporated and relied heavily on racial stereotypes. Black GI scored low on the Army General Classification Test, or the AGCT, um, but that's not surprising because three quarters of all black men who served in the Army during World War II came from the South, where most of them had less than a fourth grade education. Yes, they were sharecroppers without access to good education, so it's not surprising they didn't get good scores. Um, but in addition, even if that thought came up, which it didn't in the 1920s and 30s, um, there was racial stereotypes added bias to Army study. So here's an example of a 1936 War College study. Um, so these would have been uh, field officers going through training so they could get promoted. So this is work they would have done there. And you can see, this is just from one report, characterizations of black men. The Negro is docile, tractable, lighthearted, carefree, and good nature. He's the happy Sambo. He is careless, shiftless, irresponsible, and secretive. He's someone you can't trust. He is unmoral, untruthful, and his sense of right, is, right doing is relatively inferior. Now, if you accepted those qualities as true, it's understandable to, un to see why white army commanders decided that the overwhelming majority of black men were incapable of learning how to be combat soldiers. As a result, black GIs were disproportionately assigned to service units, and this shows up very early in the war. Uh, so at the end of the first year of the war, 1941, there's approximately 100,000 black men serving in the army. You can see they're already uh, very much ending up in service forces. One in four engineers are black, and these are black engineers you see building a run, run, airport runway on your right. One in six quartermasters were black GIs. Ultimately, by the end of the war, the majority of quartermasters will be black. At the same time, only 2% of black GIs served in the infantry to, get, to give you a sense of their ex general exclusion from combat. So that's the situation that had begun years in the 19th century and carried on uninterrupted into the first years of World War II. That's when things change, of course, because of mechanization and mobilization. Okay, got any military buffs in here? What's Blitzkrieg mean? Anybody got a translation for Blitzkrieg? Yeah. Indeed, right. So uh, Blitzkrieg was a uh, coordinated military effort by tanks, motorized infantry, artillery, and aircraft to create an overwhelming local superiority and combat power to defeat the opponent and break through its defenses. 
the more general term for coordinated use of armor, motorized infantry, and air power, as you can see here, is combined arms warfare. Uh, by the way, since we're recognizing the centrality of, of uh, combined arms warfare to modern, modern warfare, I think it would be good to point out that uh, General Blunt, using combined arms warfare, led the longest single sustained drive in the history of the U.S. Army when uh, they seized Baghdad. In 1940, it had a dramatic effect, too. Uh, German forces um, using combined arms warfare seized more French territory in four weeks than they had in four years in the First World War. The US and Britain realized that they had to fight a different kind of war than they were prepared to fight and embrace the task of modernization. <clears throat> So advances uh, it, in this modernization, there's a number of important advances. We see advances in aircraft, anti-aircraft defenses, armor, bigger bombs, increased firepower. But the really crucial thing is the second point, and that's the widespread adoption of internal combustion engines, steel armor, and lightweight aluminum. Because what this did is restored mobility to the battlefield. So World War I had become a meat grinder because why? Do you want to venture? What is this like teaching in a nine o'clock class? <laughs> it's the lack of mobility. They can't move, they get stuck in trenches, and they slug it out for four years. So the use of aircraft, the use of not only uh, tanks, but motorized infantry, so infantry that can follow up on breakthroughs made by armor is really the crucial thing. So it's a motorization of the military is the really key innovation that restores uh, rapid mobility to the battlefield. Now, fortunately for us, this played to American strengths in technical knowledge and industrial facilities. So Lieutenant, Lieutenant General Brahan Somerville was the commanding, commander of the Army Service Forces. And in a speech he gave, uh, he pointed this out to his listeners. When Hitler put this war on wheels, he ran it right down our alley. When he hitched his chariot to an internal combustion engine, he opened up a new battlefront, a front we know well. It's called Detroit. So in other words, the U.S. had invented the mass manufacture of internal combustion engines, and that was the absolutely vital piece of technology that transformed war, uh, warfare during World War II. As I noted before, um, there were problems with um, having the skilled manpower needed to support such a mechanized army. There's a number of reasons for that. So one thing was simply in 1942, as divisions started shipping overseas to the Pacific or to Britain, they would fill out combat units that were not full by transferring white GIs from service forces. So they were, in a sense, robbing Peter to pay Paul. Um, this had real consequences. In Britain, Army service forces requested 35%, essentially what would be 35% of the armed force. They only get 27%. And um, you know, in hindsight, we know that the majority of of forces must be service units to support a mechanized army. I mean, the size of service forces have only grown over time. And we get a hint of it here. Just by 1944, we can see that 59% of all army soldiers are actually in service units rather than combat units. That's how you fight this kind of war. Now, this manpower shortage um, threatened to postpone the D-Day invasion. General Somerville repeatedly informed his superiors about the manpower shortage of service units that was leading to mountains of supplies building up in Britain uh, chaotically, uh, so they would in no way be able to be, to be sent over to France. In the, in the summer of 1943, the Army Service Forces was supposed to deliver 76,000 service troops to overseas forces, but only 53,000 were available. This prompted Somerville to meet with British Prime Minister Winston Churchill to beseech him for help with labor. Um, 
in construction, in unloading ships and other service activities. His superior, the Army Chief of Staff, George Marshall, followed up with Churchill, sending him a letter um, warning that these shortages, quote, may seriously affect the preparations for Overlord, the code name for the planned invasion of France. So we have a crisis in the making because the military is going to be unable to launch large scale operations unless they're sufficiently supported and the men are skilled enough to keep the equipment operating. And this presents the opportunity for black men and women to serve in World War II. So let me start, I promised you I'd get back to the 1940 Selective Service Act, which is a really remarkable law in several ways. Never before had the United States ever had a peacetime draft. And it's su not surprising that it ran into opposition, but of course, if you know anything about America in the years immediately preceding World War II, you know that isolationism was very strong. So there was opposition to the very idea of preparing the United States to defend itself. <clears throat> As it turned out, the best supporters of a peacetime draft were Southern congressmen. The South has always been more supportive of the military, more supportive of the idea of coming to our ally, Britain. And as a consequence of these men's focus on simply getting an unpopular law passed, they didn't really say anything when a northern congressman, Hamilton Fish, a, man, a white man who commanded black troops in World War I and those Harlem Hellfighters, introduced an amendment that said that all people had, who were inducted into the military had to be selected and, and uh, assigned with equal opportunity. So within the context of segregation, this law guaranteed that you would receive equal treatment. Very shortly, so that's in the summer, then the campaign, which is unprecedented. President Roosevelt is running for a third term in office, and his opponent, as you can see here, Wendell Wilkie, uh, was quick to try to make an appeal for the black vote. Uh, he said he'd end segregation in Washington, D.C. He said he'd desegregate the United States Army. Uh, and that helps explain why prominent African Americans like Joe Lewis hit the campaign trail saying that black Americans had waited too long for FDR to make good on his promises, and so it was time for a change. And in response, FDR makes a number of concessions. Probably the most important was to appoint an official, the civilian aide of the Secretary of War, who was going to be an ombudsman, an advocate for black GIs in the War Department. Uh, later on, he, he goes on, as the election got closer and closer, he promotes uh, Colonel Benjamin Davis to make him the first black general in the US Army. Uh, he also promises to widen the number of roles that are op uh, open for black men to serve their country. The demands for equal treatment continued largely due to the efforts of black GIs themselves. Thomas Guglielmo published an article a few years ago in the Journal of American History um, where he really talked about a protest movement inside the military by black GIs. Often this is in the form of confrontations uh, with white officers who they thought were discriminating against them. More often, it was in the form of writing letters, either to your parents, more likely to the editors of black newspapers, who in turn turned them around, published them in the papers. This, by the way, was at the point of the highest uh, circulation for black newspapers in the United States. So this made sure that the black public knew that the US wasn't living up to the promises that it had made to black GIs. And so there's a drumbeat of, of call for change in the military, even as it's faced with a manpower shortage. Surprise, this gave white officers an opportunity to reconsider 
their opinion of the abilities of black GIs. Um, so it became a crucial issue in the spring of 1943, and so it became an object of debate in the Army Personnel Division. One report stated the problem. The percentage of grade five, meaning which is the lowest category, scoring category, percentage of grade five men is so high as to present an almost insurmountable, um, insurmountable obstacle in the attempt to organize effective Negro units. Um, so they came up with a new proposal. They said, what if we screened inductees based on their intelligence rather than on their literacy? Because when they really looked at it, they realized like, well, you know, if people really never went to school and they can't read and write, it's kind of unreasonable to expect them to do very well on an exam. Um, and the report accompanying this proposal uh, pointed out the Russian, our Russian and Chinese allies who, and this is very offensive, quote, uh, were both races of low so-called intelligence, unquote, nevertheless managed to use all of their manpower successfully. Um, another uh, unlikely source of support comes from Brigadier General R.E. Busby. So he was the commanding general of the Fourth Service Command, which was essentially the states of the Deep South. So here's someone who's really familiar with Southerners. And he questioned whether the AGC scores of black men could determine their intelligence, quote, due to the entirely practical life which the colored farmer lives, unquote. So he says, if we're going to drop, draft sharecroppers, um, again, probably tests based on literacy are not the best way to see, determine their ability to learn, which was the purpose of the AGCT. So as you can see here, on June 1st, 1943, the Army Service Forces, or the Army, announced a new policy that they would screen inductees by their intelligence rather than by their literacy. This was a really complete effort. The Army devoted every bit of resources it could. I think that really good evidence that they um, were, were grappling with this problem. They developed tests for people who could not read just to evaluate their uh, intelligence. And uh, this would actually sometimes be several rounds of interviews. Uh, so it was a lot more work on the part of the induction centers. But the idea was to screen the inductees, the people who have been drafted more finely so they could retain more qualified black GIs. I think the real evidence of the Army's determination to make this thing work can be seen in this picture. All right. This is a textbook that was used at special training units. So these were created to um, educate illiterate uh, but intelligent men. So you can see here 260,000 men between 1943 and the end of the war were assigned to these units. And they essentially learned how to read and write. And more importantly, for people from rural plantations, how to operate in a complex organization. So these are based after the C. Dick and Jane books. So these are kind of phonic level second grade books that are being used to teach uh, men in these special training units. And if you see the kinds of things that are being focused on, it's things they would need to know to comply and be good soldiers. Um, in an example of a conversation that would go on in one of these classes, um, an instructor had uh, the men talk about the division of labor within their family, about how they had dinners together to explain the division of labor within the army and units of you know, how things got done. So break it down to really basic levels um, so that people could function properly in the army. They also changed the training. Um, rather than it being very textbook based, it was very hands on demonstration, taking apart motors. And they also established new training bases, the, the two that really stand out. Uh, the one that Odor Bradley was sent to at Warren, Wyoming. Uh, there was also a new base established to train quartermasters at Camp Lee, which is the uh, headquarters for the quartermasters. 
Okay, so now we're in a new moment, right? We have a situation where black men aren't being kicked out of the army for being illiterate. They're being trained and they're receiving training in some of the skilled uh, tasks that the military desperately needs performed to keep this uh, war engine going. Uh, but as I started to look into it, I realized um, that labor and diplomatic relations would determine whether or not white officers would feel comfortable experimenting with assigning formerly white jobs to black soldiers. Now, I, I want to say something a little bit more generally about how I deal with this in the book, um, which, by the way, I should have said it's, it's under contract with the University Press of Kansas. It's out for uh, review with the readers now, right now. Um, so what I do in the book is I follow GIs and service units to every theater of the war and look at the work that they did. And so as I was saying, the inclination of white officers was to try new kinds of roles for black GIs. The pattern varied widely. So what I'm doing is I'm just giving you two examples that give you a sense of the range of outcomes for black GIs. Everywhere overseas, black GIs, it's important to remember, worked alongside thousands, if not tens of thousands, of civilian workers in construction projects and in supply operations. And in each theater, the book examines how jobs from the American military and the presence of black troops affected labor relations and diplomatic relations in the countries that are affected. And we see kind of, we can sort this out in a broad pattern. In places where people of color were the majority, to make a broad generalization, Africa, Southeast Asia, and the South Pacific, um, the Army not only gave black GIs many, many new roles that they'd never had before, but also recognized that they got along so well working with the local people of color that they made them supervise the work. So again, definitely not a black job. In the US South, in Europe and in the West Indies, which I'll talk about shortly, um, the roles that black GIs could play in the war effort were limited due to these considerations of labor relations and diplomatic relations. So let, let's start out by looking at the West Indies. Uh, so this is a photo taken from a, a strike protest in uh, uh, the West Indies during the 1930s. Uh, they're pretty serious about getting what they want, as you can see. Plantation workers, which is the economy of the West Indies, suffered from low wages, long hours, and the fact that uh, the planters were willing to employ child labor. And so as a consequence, during the 1930s, uh, the islands are rocked again and again, uh, either by strikes or by riots, uh, where workers were expressing outrage at their mistreatments. Uh, this went to the extent that Jamaica at one point had the British troops had to be sent to restore order. Uh, the first troops, first U.S. troops that were sent uh, to the West Indies were sent to Jamaica to put help restore order after another labor protest. So this is a hotbed of workers determined, now that they form unions, to get a better deal from themselves. During World War II, um, there's a complicated story that I'll make really simple. Uh, the United States traded battleships for military bases in the Caribbean with the British. And so we ended up taking control of these islands as so far as we could have ports and supply depots in the Caribbean on this crucial route into the Atlantic. And so America was the one that was responsible for making sure the facilities were capable of supporting mechanized warfare. And of course, the existing facilities were mostly not. I mean, they're for uh, shipping out bananas or plantation once a year. They're for having tourists come in. Uh, so this is a massive, massive construction project. And in those construction projects, there's a real opportunity gap that struck the workers of the West Indies. Um, American workers got high wages um, and better, and um, yeah, received the same wages they were paid in the U.S. Uh, plus, they received additional pay for working overseas. Uh, 
By contrast, the U.S. military paid West Indian workers exactly what they had made before the war, despite all the inflation that came with wartime shortages, because that had been the request of British colonial governments who feared losing their entire plantation workforce as they deserted to go work uh, for American forces. So again, this leads to a huge gap. So let me give you one example in British Guiana. An American tractor driver received $10 a day for work. Uh, a local tractor driver got $2.80 a day for the exact same work. This was appalling and led directly to a strike. Uh, U.S. troops had to be called in to quell the violence that was associated with that strike. I'll uh, give you a couple more examples. In Trinidad, West Indian Union leaders went so far as to invoke the U.S. National Labor Relations Act because they were begging American labor leaders to come to their aid to help them get a fair deal in the, the wartime economy. Now, since neither the U.S. or the British government attempted to formulate any kind of standard policy, the best I could figure out was that the urgency of military construction and the militancy of the local workers determined the outcomes of these contests. So often, they won. Um, at the same time, the mere presence of black troops was controversial. British colonial governors had asked the U.S. not to deploy U Brit uh, black troops to their islands because they had a higher standard of living than the local people did. And they feared, of course, that unfavorable comparisons would lead to disturbances, and they were right. White colonists in Bermuda felt so strongly about this that they actually sent a delegation to Washington, D.C. to lobby against having black troops sent to their island. Surprisingly, black West Indian leaders, that's right, black West Indian leaders also opposed black troops, in this case because they feared that the U.S. Army would introduce segregation into the islands where it had never existed before. As a result of these uh, objections, the Army did not send any black troops to the Caribbean. Uh, it wasn't until April 1942 when the supply of the black GIs became critical. And then they only sent them to Trinidad, where they sent a little more than 2,000 men. So in this case, diplomatic and labor relations had limited the opportunities of black men. Now, that's in sharp contrast to what we're going to find in Burma. So if you want to know how do you build a road over the Himalaya Mountains, this is how you do it. This is the Lido Road. Soon after Pearl Harbor, Japanese forces invaded Burma. And by the end of May, they had cut off the Burma Road, which you can see here on this map, which was China's last land route to the west. So at this point, the Japanese occupied the west coast of China, so it's impossible to supply them by sea, uh, and now there's no way to supply them by land. You might ask, why does this matter? Well, at this point in the war, early point in the war, U.S. military commanders assumed the most likely base for launching an invasion of the Japanese home islands would be China. Uh, so there was imperative to keep them fighting in the war. Moreover, there were more than a million Japanese troops fighting the Chinese in China. And had China simply negotiated or gave up, that would have meant there would have been one million more Japanese troops fighting American forces in the Pacific. So the Lido Road was the new land supply line over the Himalaya Mountains, and it was primarily constructed by black engineers, while the supplies were mainly uh, drip delivered by black drivers. So something like 80% of the troops on the business end of this theater of the war were black. Black GIs um, had benefits that came from their ability to get along with local workers who felt they were the Americans they could trust the most. I think the example that really struck me, the Pat Kai Mountains, which is the eastern range of the Himalayas, um, and so that's um, so going right to this area right here, was the home of a local tribe of Henners known as the Naga. And um, 
GIs got along with them fine. They'd, give, they'd hitchhike, and the GIs would pick them up in their trucks. Uh, they liked to trade goods with the Naga. Uh, sometimes they employed the Naga to rescue uh, pilots that had been shot down. Very straightforward deal. They saved the pilot. We gave them opium. <laughs> One sign of how well the two groups got along was the decision by the Naga to shelter an AWOL black GI named Herman Perry for almost two years, despite a uh, determined effort of Army forces to recapture him. So this ability to get along with the locals explains why black GIs were often put in charge of supervisors. Uh, so the bulk of the work done on this road was done by Asian indentured service that the British had sent from their tea plantations in India and coal mines to come do the heavy work of cutting through the jungle with machetes. Uh, the women were involved in this too. The women would carry off rocks and baskets on their head, which would be ground up for gravel. So this is really, really intense manual labor. Black GIs, oh, wait, one more point. Uh, the interaction between the, so the, between the black sergeants who supervised this workforce daily on the road was so extensive that after the war, it turns out some of the Burmese were surprised to find out that all Americans were not black. That those are the only Americans they ever dealt with. The important thing in terms of the larger argument here is that in the China-Burma-India theater, specifically on the Burma end of this theater, black GIs received the most diverse work assignments of any theater in the war. They essentially performed every single job in the service forces. Um, so the intermediate section would be between Assam and about this point on the Lido Road. And Army commanders were all, any Army commanders that had black troops were requested at the end of the war to complete a report evaluating the performance of black troops. So just this one section of the China Burma India Theater reported that black GIs had taken on roles as blacksmiths, carpenters, clerks, cooks, draftsmen, electricians, firemen, instructional supervisors, machinists, mechanics, pneumatic tool operators, riggers, surveyors, teletype mechanics, truck drivers, and water supply operators. So the idea of white and black jobs had simply died in Burma. It didn't make sense. It was a very inefficient use of military manpower. Um, they were remote from areas of combat, so that's why the Army felt comfortable having a concentration of black troops, and then once they're letting them, because labor relations were good, to let them uh, experiment with having them do everything. Um, we have some good feedback in these reports. Um, one engineer, white engineer uh, officer said, describing these black GIs, they have built hundreds of miles of road, moved millions of tons of earth, and operated millions of dollars of heavy equipment. Full credit is due to them. And so now let's turn to, I'm going to close out by looking at uh, briefly at diplomatic relations uh, that become problematic between the, with France and with New Caledonia, surprisingly involving the same issue. So following the June 4th, 1944 invasion of France. Many French people feel, according to Mary Louise Roberts, like they had been occupied by the American forces, right? Uh, it's a rural, Normandy's a rural part of the country. There's overwhelming numbers of Americans. Um, as with any army, uh, there, were at, there were men having sex with locals, often with uh, accusations that rape was going on. But what What's happening in France was that there was a wave of accusations against black GIs and that local French authorities were pointing to this to discredit America, to say that America wasn't a good partner to France in the war. And a lot of this had to do with the fact that at the point of the D-Day invasion, uh, the United States had not recognized the French, uh, the free French government of Charles de Gaulle. So there was a sense of the French had lost their sovereignty and Americans were just doing what they wanted and inflicting these black people on them. And of course, behind the lines, 
that's where the civilians are, and that's also where most of the service forces are. So there was a disproportionate number of black men behind the, the lines. Even though there was lots of evidence that many of these charges were completely false, um, white army officers, considering the importance of France and the support of the French people to the campaign, the invasion of Germany, simply went along and made uh, black GIs scapegoats uh, for the sins of all uh, American GIs. Uh, a very disproportionate number were charged and executed and hung by the neck, including Emmett Till's father, as we recently learned from a new textbook, a new book on the subject. We find the exact opposite thing happening in another French territory, the island, the Pacific island of New Caledonia. Um, the governor of the colony is appalled at the occupation by U.S. forces uh, at any given time on the island of Caledonia, the natives might be outnumbered by service person, American service personnel, three to one, four to one. So really, there was the sense of being besieged. Uh, the local economy has kind of gone to waste. And uh, the governor doesn't feel that U.S. forces are responding enough to the concerns of him, and especially the planners uh, who are losing their labor force to American construction projects. So like local leaders had in France, he raises the, the specter of black rapists, calling uh, GIs the terror of white women. But now here's when something interesting happens. Rather than going along and cooperating with court-martialing men on dubious evidence, instead, white officers in New Caledonia actually sent evidence that black GIs were no more to commit rape crimes than white GIs, and they refused to make the capital Numia off limits to black GIs. They essentially ignored uh, the colonial governor. And that really goes to the point that, you know, New Caledonia was far behind the lines. It was not a crucial point in the war. Um, and so the US forces could simply do what they wanted. Um, and so these diplomatic circumstances could have a huge impact on the treatment of black GIs and on their ability to do things in that theater of the war. So in both Europe and New Caledonia, we see black men restricted to a smaller number of occupations. The one you're probably familiar with is the Red Ball Express in France, uh, which was mostly 75% black drivers. Uh, but so this is an explanation for why we consistently don't see the desegregation of military occupations across the US Army. So what have we learned here? Mechanization created the manpower shortage in Army service forces. Mobilization put black men in the Army and created political pressure to assign them roles other than menial labor. White officers responded by changing their opinion of black abilities and establishing new procedures for screening and training black men. Labor and diplomatic relations determined the extent to which black GIs could perform formerly white jobs. Now, I think there's a few important conclusions that might be relevant to us today that we can draw from this. One, if you see uh, the opening of new, new occupations, or at least the end of jobs that kept blacks in their place as an achievement, you see that it was done uh, incrementally. And if you look at the long history of the integration of the military, that's the pattern. So not we are, we are conditioned by the Southern Civil Rights Movement to expect major uh, changes to happen, the passage of the Civil Rights, the passage of the Voting Rights Act. Uh, but in the Army, I think we find something that's closer to reality, especially in American workplaces. The change takes place slowly over time. It's often dependent on contingent events. You know, had there been more support for the Selective Service Act of 1940, maybe Southerners would have prevented the amendment from being added to that law that insisted that black men did have a right to equal treatment in the Army, for example. Um, the accomplishments of black GIs, when they had these new roles, also paved uh, the way for future progress. So when President Truman decided in 1948 to issue an executive order to desegregate the US military, part of what influenced his decision were these reports, like the one I shared with you, that showed how many things and how well black GIs and service forces had done during World War II. Black GIs also helped themselves in ways that really are very reminiscent 
of um, the circumstances of, of today's volunteer army. Uh, studies have been done using census records and other things that determined that black veterans had higher incomes than black men who had not been veterans. They had lower unemployment. Uh, they were also much more likely to move out of the South to the industrial areas where the skills they had were the ones most sought after by industrial employers after the war. So I think in these ways, we can see that by looking at war as labor, right, by looking at the increasing importance of work that's not directly related to combat, uh, we can see ways that have been overlooked uh, that help blacks to progress in the institution that I argue is probably the best integrated in America. Thank you very much. For that feedback. I mean, that's the, that is a really important thing. John Sell, who's a leading historian of the institution of segregation, points out it's, it's segregation about far more than the physical separation of people of different color. Uh, it was about maintaining a racial hierarchy that kept people in their place. And because the Army was drawing on the same traditions of the U.S. South, um, it had the same effect as Jim Crow. jobs for black PIs that are significantly more technical and technically skilled than like a combat job in the infantry room, right? Oh, that's a good point. So you actually get, because they have to make the shift mid-war, they're actually providing more opportunities for black PIs than white PIs that are going straight to combat. Oh, almost like affirmative action. <laughs> <laughs> or but, like, it's just, it's just an interesting point that you get, I mean, you get some of the same thing. I mean, it's just like the people who get like sort of pushed out of combat roles because they don't fit the physique or whatever. And then they end up with technical skills that they can then use later. That actually right, I mean, black GIs were the only labor force available. Yeah. At that point to solve that problem. And they just, I really have to, I mean, it seems in hindsight it would be so obvious because we've lived with our whole lives with militaries that have much larger service forces than combat forces that they just had no idea how much work it would be. You just even the supply chain, you know, you have to plan that a truck is gonna last for a certain number of years and in that time it's gonna need so many tires and you know, so many crankshafts or whatnot. So this, it's really complex logistical and technical challenge. But do you have any evidence that this then leads to better opportunities like you have it here like black veterans employ higher incomes than black folks who are not veterans but what about white combat veterans in the infantry that were not specialists oh that's interesting you mentioned that the same research found did found that there was not the same pattern hmm. um, although if, if white if, if white men who were not veterans did well that might also just reflect the privileged place of white men in the 1940s. I think you'd have to look at employment placement, like what kinds of jobs they're getting. Right. Like if these jobs need technical skill versus if they don't. I don't know. Interesting. Thank you. Any other questions? Hey Douglas, I, I thoroughly enjoyed this and um, you made reference <coughs> to soldiers and interactions with um, local populations, but did you see 
any instances of interactions with other colonial conscri conscripted troops. So like, you know, um, people from the British Caribbean fighting, um, fighting for England, for example, um, or any of the African troops that were mobilized by their colonial powers. Are there opportunities for interaction? Did it I mean, that's a really that? good question. That was actually one of the questions I got from one of the readers of my book proposal. Um, unfortunately, I, I wasn't able to get the kind, I have very granular evidence about interactions with civilians, and I just couldn't find that uh, with, with colonial troops. Uh, I think maybe the only area where they were really together to a large extent would have been North Africa and in India. Um, but that just didn't come. That's a very interesting question. Well, thank you very much. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Bristol. A fascinating talk. Uh, we certainly appreciate that and, and the work you did uh, as our last blunt professor. Uh, our most recent, not the last blunt professor, but our most recent blunt professor, because we have another one. And uh, I'd like to, I'd like to. Oh. <laughs> so, we have, I, it, it is now my distinct honor, and I gave away the punchline already here with this slide, but to introduce our 2023-2025 uh, uh, Blunt Professor of Military History, Dr. Andrew Wiest. Dr. Wiest is, is here in the room. And uh, Dr. Wiest is a university distinguished professor of history and the founding director of the Dale Center for the Study of War and Society. He is a specialist in military history with a focus that has shifted over the years from World War I to the Vietnam War, and now to the Global War on Terror. Uh, Dr. Wiest will use the Blunt Professorship's funds to conduct oral histories, as well as support the research and writing of his forthcoming book, entitled Thunder on the Euphrates, the 150th Combat Engineers in Iraq in 2005. The book will tell the story of the transformation of the U.S. National Guard during the War on Terror by using the experience of the 150th as a case study. So in the 21st century, the National Guard shifted from a force chiefly relied on for home front duties to being a force used over and over again in combat uh, with repercussions that stretched from nearby, the living rooms of Loosedale, Mississippi, uh, all the way to the halls of power in Washington, DC. This is a, a a story that's, or, or a, uh, a topic that's near and dear to my heart. I have a number of family members who've served in the Mississippi Guard. Uh, and also, many of us probably know Guard troops from Mississippi who've been deployed uh, over the years in Afghanistan and Iraq and in other places around the world. And so I think it's a, a fascinating topic. We look forward to this lecture in 2025 when Dr. Wiest will tell us about uh, his work. So congratulations to Dr. Wiest. Uh, on being our next, not the last, but our next uh, blunt professor. So, congratulations. <laughs> so, I just wanted to uh, thank um, Dr. Bristol for his wonderful talk and for Dr. Uh, Weiss, sorry, not Dr. Weiss, Dr. Winstead for um, uh, emceeing tonight and also uh, to General Blunt for all his support over the years. Uh, and invite you all as you go out to take a look at some of the other uh, blunt professorship books that are on the back table. Um, and if you are interested in donating to the blunt professorship uh, uh, fund, there's also a QR code back there for you. So thank you very much for coming, and I hope you have a good evening.